Well, good evening and welcome to our service uh, Christmas Eve at Southside Bible Church. My name is Ken and I'm glad that you have come to be with us. If you're visiting, this is easily my favorite night of the year. I love Christmas Eve and I just want to slow down and um, focus on the incarnation tonight. I know a lot of you have been busy and there's so many different plans. And so let's just kind of pray and ask God to quiet our hearts and we will open the word of God. Father, we come to you, and we do. We, uh, I think of that ship where the storm was going, and the apostles were afraid, and they woke you, and you just said, shh, and the waves were calm. And I, I just pray that you would do that to every mind and heart right now. There are a lot of things racing around, and I just ask, Jesus, that you would say, shh, and just calm every mind and heart now to listen to the word of God. I pray that uh, you would give comprehension to every mind and every heart and soul in this room. God, I pray that you will attend the preaching of your word and that you will do mighty things in our midst in this hour. And so, God, I thank you for the word of God and I thank you for the word, the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. I pray that you would be glorified in our remembrance tonight. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Tonight, we're going to look at the fact that God the Father, He so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son into it to come and to save the world. And on the first Christmas morning, the eternal Son of God entered into the world that He created as the fulfillment of a bunch of promises. And it's so important that we don't miss this, as God promised a king to Israel who would be superior to all the other kings that Israel had ever known And there were some amazing things that were said about this king who would be coming. His name would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. His name will will be Emmanuel, God with us. His kingdom will have no end. It will be eternal. He'll be a king that will deliver his people from all of their enemies. And he will bring about an eternal peace. He has been the hope of Israel for thousands of years, waiting for the fulfillment of this promise of this king. And so the storyline of the Bible is God's long withstanding promise to bring salvation through his king. And so the Old and the New Testament, they're they're one book. They're, They're one story of God's saving plan through his son. And so please get this when you come to Matthew. Uh, you're not, Jesus isn't introduced two thirds of the way into your Bible. But when, when it says a son is born, that is not the beginning of the Bible talking about Jesus. Who is this baby born? Amazing things are starting to happen around the birth of Christ. Zacharias and Elizabeth have a baby in their old age. Mary is a virgin and she conceives a child. Simeon says he won't die until he sees the Lord's salvation. And now he breaks forth into prophecy. This is the one we've been waiting for. Anna's been serving in the temple waiting. And she's saying, here it is. They're proclaiming and they're singing. This is the long-awaited promise that God has made for thousands of years. And so Christmas does not begin in Matthew. It begins in Genesis. God said, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel, speaking of salvation that would come through the line uh, through Adam. So Jesus has been promised and pictured and prophesied throughout the whole Old Testament. Israel has been told of the coming of the ultimate conquest of their supreme king. And they've just had one bad king after another. And sin continues and enemies keep crushing them because of their sin. And so the golden promise of the coming of the Christmas king has been held out to this people. This was the blessed hope of Israel and the consolation that they have been looking for for generation after generation. And tonight, we're going to go back into Israel's history, and we're going to look at one of these great promises. So if you'll turn with me to Micah chapter 5, and I want to let this passage contribute to the story of Christmas. And as we turn, I just want to give you a quick context, and I mean quick. On Christmas Eve, I try to preach a little shorter, but I've been bottled up, so no promises tonight. King Solomon has died. And now there's this bitter civil war in Israel, and it ends now in two kingdoms. They have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. 
The northern kingdom has spiritual adultery and harlotry and it chases after other gods and idols and does what God said do not do. So God sends the nation Assyria to come in and chastise them in 722 B.C. Twenty years later, Assyria is now going after the southern kingdom. And they're outside now the city walls of Judah. And they're, they're taunting Israel. And they're targeting their king, who happens to be Hezekiah at that time. And what they're trying to do is get a quick surrender. They want them to just give up. Your king can't even protect himself. How can he protect you? Your God can't save you. Give up. And they're trying to talk Israel then into, into surrender. The southern kingdom has played the harlot as well now. But in their way, materialism is what is ruling the day in the southern kingdom. Their leaders and their judges are corrupt. They're being bought off. The rich are suppressing the poor. One of the most famous verses that most of us know in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, is he has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. They're oppressing the poor and they're unjust, unjust to one another. And so now they're going to be punished because of this nation is playing the harlotry as well. So God sends a prophet to them by the name of Micah. And he's to come and to proclaim to them that there will be judgment and then there'll be salvation. Salvation always comes from a deserved judgment. And so Micah is going to give to the people that there's a, a promised day coming with a king who can deliver you from all of your enemies. He can deliver you physically from your enemies and spiritually from this enemy of sin that just keeps destroying Israel after a seasons of apostasy and return again and again has been the history of this nation. We need someone to save our hearts that are sinful, and so we need a king who can save us. And Micah gives them the promise of a Christmas king. And so I want to ask a few questions tonight to get at its meaning. So if you'll look with me at verse 1, I think the verses are going to come up on the screen. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. I want to ask first, what is going on? Look at verse 1. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us, the Assyrians. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. And so the Assyrians have now surrounded us. Muster up your troops. They're going to strike the judge of Israel, which would be the king, the, the leader. They're going to strike him on the cheek, which is the, one of the greatest insults you could do. They're going to insult the king. In 2 Kings 18, there's a description of the ridicule that they brought to Hezekiah. And so this is God's judgment on the unfaithfulness of this nation. Just another king in Israel who has run his course, and now it's ended in chastisement. That's the history of this nation. And so my question then is, who can help? Who can help? And Micah answers that in verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. And his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Here is the superiority of God's king. God says, from, from you, one will go forth. And here's the key phrase, for me, to be a ruler in Israel. This king will not come for his own selfish agenda and his program. He will not come and exploit you and try to build his own kingdom. This king will come for me. He will be a representative of God. In fact, he'll be the exact radiance and representation of God. He will come and he will be for me. Uh, Jesus came and he said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. I am the king who has come for him to do his will. If you see me, you've seen the Father. His will is my will. And so this king will look out first and foremost for the interest of God and not his own. Oh, what a king this will be after all that Israel has been through. But I want you to hear one more thing about him in verse 2. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. That's some strange phraseology. This Christmas king is the eternal God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, several of our pastors, one preached on that, one preached on John 1, that he was eternal. The word became flesh. So the one that was born on Christmas morning was the eternal son of God. Eternity stepped into time, and he was born to be the king that would save this world. Look with me in verse 4, if you could put that up, Micah 5, 4. 
and he will arise, and this king will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great, and he'll do it to the very ends of the earth. And so this king is going to come, and he's going to be great, and his kingdom is going to go to the very ends of the earth like no other king that Israel has ever known. He's going to be the one who comes and represents me, says God. He's going to be eternal, and his kingdom is going to have no end. It's going to go to the ends of the earth. What an amazing king that's being promised to Israel. What a future for his people. What a promise. Yet within this promise of the greatest eternal king, the, the, the one who will have a heart for God, the one who will be great, the question begs, where is a king like this going to be born? Like, this king should be born in Jerusalem where there's a temple and there's a palace and you have the whole nation worshiping him. That's how kings come into the world with pomp and stance and cir- celebration and all of those things. That's how this king should come in. But we're told by God to Micah, come with me to the Christmas story of verse 2. He says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. It's it's such a small little town, he says, of of very little significance, lowly Bethlehem. It takes a a little of the flash and glitter out of the king that I have just described, who's the eternal God, and he's going to come into this world into Bethlehem, the little lowly city. And Luke 2 says that about a thousand years later that Quirinius was governor And all of a sudden, this governor decides that he wants to take a census of the entire inhabited earth. And it just so happens that David has to go back to Bethlehem to register, and his wife's nine months pregnant. Here's God a thousand years telling you what he will do. And now in time and space, God now moves the heart, and he directs his plan to work it out exactly according to plan to bring it to Bethlehem. Right at the time. The sovereign, glorious plan of God now fulfilling all these promises that we see in our Old Testament. So the the trek begins and into uh, Bethlehem, and there's no room at the end, so they go into a stable. And and the king was born in that stable, and they wrapped wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and they laid him in a manger, which is, is 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 a feeding dish for animals. The birth announcement was made by lowly shepherds who couldn't even testify in court because of their character. His parents didn't have two nickels to rub together. And so here comes this eternal one that I've just described, now born into Bethlehem and even in a manger in a stable with no pomp and circumstance. A little town of Bethlehem. I still think it's because a king of this magnitude is so frightening to approach. And it's almost like he lowers the bar to the lowliest of places for the humble and the broken that they might come to him and find life. You know, Bethlehem means heaven's bread. And so God put the bread of life into Bethlehem, this little manger, so that the humble who will come and feed on him and look to him for life and and the source and the power and everything in Christ. So what what he's calling for is for the humble who will come to this eternal king, born into a manger, who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls. So beautiful. I want to give you just a little history on one other very important part about Bethlehem. Bethlehem doesn't have a lot of exciting things, but there was another king who was born there. Do you know who that was? There, There was a man named Jesse. And Jesse had a large family that he raised in Bethlehem. And God says to Israel, I'm going to provide for myself a king. They chose Saul because he was so tall. He was a complete failure. God says, I'll pick a king now. And I'm going to pick one from the sons of Jesse. And so Jesse comes and he parades all of his sons before the prophet to anoint him. And he has seven perfect models of strong, handsome sons. But there was this one who was absent and he was regarded as insignificant. He's out caring for sheep. He's a shepherd. He was the lowly brother, and there was no surprise. He's a shepherd boy. And yet God says, that's the one that I pick because he's a man after my own heart. That is the one that God chose from Bethlehem. And David becomes the greatest king that Israel had ever known up to the king that's being described now in Micah 5. And then God tells Israel, 
a descendant's going to come from David, and he's going to sit on his throne, but his kingdom will have no end. It's the very first thing the angel told Mary when she was told she was pregnant. Now in the history of Israel, we have watched predecessor after predecessor of David come and fail miserably. And now both kingdoms are on the brink of captivity and devastation because of sin and the rulers of the people and the people. And this nation is, is, is ready to come into extinction. So in our promise here tonight in Micah 5, God comes back to the same place to hew out a king for the nations, to bring about the most prominent king who would destroy all of Israel's enemies and bring salvation to the ends of the earth and his kingdom would have no end. Here, here he is. Thirdly, what will be the characterization of his rule if you'll pull up verse 5? What is his rule going to be characterized then? In verse 5, and this one will be our peace. He is going to be the one who's going to bring peace with God. We're born in this world enemies of God because we want to be God. And Jesus Christ has come to bring peace with God between God and sinners. And so his characterization of his rule is going to be that of peace. Peace with God, peace in your heart, peace with others. It's going to, it's going to just be characterized by peace. And I want you to listen to how close this is to Luke 2. Just listen to these verses. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David... There has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, that King of Micah 5. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel, the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. He will bring peace to the one who comes to this King. The king will bring peace to everyone who will receive him and come under his jurisdiction, under his reign. Jesus was wrapped in the white flag of peace. He has come to bring salvation for our enemies from our sin, which will destroy us from the devil who has the power over death now to destroy you and send you into hell because of it and the power over death. And I'm telling you, he came to save you and deliver you from God the Father. God the Father is holy and he hates sin. Jesus Christ came to save you from the Father because of the wrath of God is upon you for sin. Jesus came and he bore that wrath on a cross to appease the Father so that now you could have peace with him. To make peace is what will characterize him. He's the Prince of Peace to those whom are his citizens. He came to bring peace and that's why I'm preaching tonight to every soul and every heart. He offers peace to your troubled soul and to your separation from God and all that you're facing tonight. He has come to give you peace. I laugh at all the nations and companies and universities trying to make peace. And all we are is a history of wars and conflicts and feuds. They can't bring peace. Even though we try to visualize it, there is only one who can make peace, and that's the Christmas King who has come into this world. And so my last question is, when? When is this King going to come? The southern kingdom would later be destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And Israel hadn't had a king then since. Hundreds and hundreds of years, so the question is when? We don't even have a king anymore. Who is the king that Mike is talking about? Well, after Jesus was born, King Herod was jealous of this king that he heard was born. And he sought out to find where would that king be born. And he calls in the wise men, and he he asks them where, and they say, in Bethlehem. And they quote Micah 5. And they they quote it, said, that's where the king is going to come. He's going to come into Bethlehem. What was born in that manger on Christmas morning was the hope of Israel for thousands of years since that first promise in Genesis. He was the greatest superior king who would save his people from their sin 
and he would reign over the universe and he would bring peace to everyone who had come under his reign. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. And so the question as we close out, it's got to be answered tonight. And you might not want to answer this, but it's, it must be answered. The king is going to return. And it's gonna be, he's going to be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and he won't come in a manger this time. He's going to come in full power to judge the living and the dead. He's coming again, and so here's the question. Is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? We live in the day of apostasy. The scriptures say in those days, most people's love will grow cold. In this day, so many people name the name of the king, and yet they still rule their own lives. Their own plans still are sovereign to them. Their, their own goals are what drive them. Their own sex lives, they determine. Their own money, if I had to summarize it, it's their own will. They, they call him Lord, but their own will is still what drives their lives. And you might be sitting here right now knowing that you're the one. You're guilty, you're the man. Is he your Lord? Jesus says that many on the last day when there's judgment, he says, you're going to come and say, Lord, Lord. So you're going to say he's your Lord. And, and, he, and he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. I never knew you, you who practiced lawlessness. You know what that means? You who had never come under my kingship. You who professed me as Lord, but you would never surrender your life to me. You can talk religious all you want. You can put a little baby in a manger this season. You can eat ham and celebrate and sing hymns. But until you come under the lordship of Jesus Christ, that lordship will destroy you on the last day. Is he your Lord? Is he your king? What was born in the manger that day was the fulfillment of Micah's prophecy hundreds and hundreds of years before. He is the Lord. Have you come to that place where you have bowed your knee to him over every area of your life? All to Jesus I surrender. You've got to answer that question tonight because you may be celebrating your judge. Are you playing around with this? Have you surrendered your life to King Jesus? That demands an answer in Micah 5. I want to close out, and I'm going to ask you four ways to surrender, to, to help you. You've got to believe these things to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The first you need to believe in is death. Micah tells us that he's going to be a shepherd. He's going to come and he'll be the shepherd king who will shepherd his people. And then later on when Jesus comes to the earth, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I will come and I'm going to go up on a cross and I'm going to die for the sins of my people. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. He was on that cross receiving the justice of God for your sin so that if you would come to him and believe, you might find the mercy and forgiveness of God for your sin. Please see this tonight. What you don't do with my message is to go out and say, you know, honey, I need to knuckle down. I need to get a little more serious about my faith. I'm going to actually read my Bible once this year. I'm, I'm going to really get after this. That is not the answer tonight. Rather, you need to surrender at the sight of the sacrificial lamb. You need to look at Jesus hanging on a cross in your place, bearing the wrath of God. And when you look at that, that brings a glad surrender. That is the only thing that will ever bring you under the lordship of Jesus Christ when you see who he is and you see what he has done for you. It disarms you. It disarms you from all your fighting against God. We can trust someone like this. I'm going to give my whole life to this person, this king. The only way I can is because this king died for me. He was the lamb of God who gave himself away for me. That takes my heart away. And now you are my king. And I gladly bow my knee and I gladly surrender to King Jesus. You will never get there until you see the cross of Jesus Christ as the most lovely thing that you've ever looked at. Him taking away your iniquity before God Almighty. You will never bow your knee until you see the beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ. Secondly, you need to believe his word. This is the word of God. He is not my king unless I do what this word says. I'm tired of a generation that says I love Jesus and I won't obey his word. 
He's king. He's the king, the promised one that we've been waiting for. I obey his word. You have the rule and the reign over my life. I'm, it isn't going to be what do I think is right? How do I define what marriage is? How do I define all these different things in our day and age that all that matters is an emotional answer? The word of God. I obey it. It's God's word. It's the king telling me who I am, how I live, what he requires of me, O oh man. Obey the word of God. Thirdly, stop worrying. Worrying is trying to be God. This is the king. And you, you could see him work in a way where he could, he could make a Quirinius the governor decide he wants to number the people to get him to Bethlehem. He's over everything. And when you can finally realize this king who has loved me and now he's my father because of what Jesus did on a cross, I can trust him. I can trust this king. Quit being God and surrender your lives to trust the king. And fourthly, I want you to, to believe and start expecting because I hear it all the time. People will never change. I'll never change. You know what Gabriel said to Mary, the, the angel when he appeared? He said, with God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. And you are now joined to Christ and you have his power. His power can change and transform us into something that will look like the king. And so are you tired of moralism, 12 steps, trying to clean yourself up and it never works? There's a power to this king who can begin to change and transform you from the inside to the outside. And so I offer to you the king of Micah 5. And he was born in this manger in that lowly place so that you might come to this king and surrender your life and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I close with one of my favorite Christmas hymns. In 1865, a young preacher traveled abroad to Palestine and he came to Bethlehem. And it was the area where they think that Jesus was born and there was a little church there. And he attended it. It was Christmas Eve. And he showed up and it started at 10 p.m., and the service went to 3 a.m. So I'm doing pretty good, right? It's only 5.30. And so he attends it, and he was so touched by the service that he wrote a song about that time in Bethlehem as he sat there. And I just want to read a couple lines, and we'll close in prayer. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above the deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hope and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Here's Israel's king that we've been hoping for. Here it is. How silently, how do I receive this king? How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. Isn't it beautiful how God gave his gift without a ripple? just so silently here in Bethlehem. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear can hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. He will enter into your very life, to your very heart, to give you this salvation and to change and transform you into the image of God. I pray that, that another Christmas will not go by without you knowing this king who was promised in Micah 5. He's the sweetest thing I've ever known. And his rule and his reign is the most beautiful thing I've ever surrendered to and lived to. I pray, come to Jesus Christ. Come to this king and find life. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and I thank you for the promise of this king. God, he is altogether lovely. He's not just a sovereign, he's a savior. Lord, how are those two bound together so perfectly? The sovereign king who, who rules over all has come into a manger. God is so lowly, little Bethlehem, and he could have been born in a hotel and you put him in a donkey's dish. God, it is so humbling and so beautiful that it just opens up for the greatest of sinners to come humbly to this King of kings and Lord of lords for salvation. I pray let no soul be afraid to stay away from the King. God, let them see the beauty of this humble King and let them tonight come and repent of sin 
and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is this king and he was the Savior King. God, let them see that tonight and believe and be saved. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.